everybody, Crow back again, and that can only mean one thing, and that's that I've recently finished playing all the games in Delphine Software Collection 1 for the Evercade. And what I want to do here is talk briefly about this collection as a whole, how I played these games, and I want to go into my experience with each of the four games in this collection, and then I'm going to rank this collection as a whole against all the other Evercade collections I've talked about so far. As usual, this Evercade cartridge comes in a clamshell case. It includes a full color manual. And as a bonus, you get a double-sided mini poster with this one featuring another world on one side and Future Wars on the other. The games included in order of release are Future Wars Time Travelers from 1989, a point and click adventure game for the Amiga. Operation Stealth from 1990, also a point and click adventure game for the Amiga. It also includes the action-adventure game Another World from 1991, although back in the day when I played it, this was known as Out of This World in North America, and I believe the name of the game was changed because at that time there was a long-running soap opera called Another World, and I guess they just wanted to have it be distinct, as if there would be any confusion because I don't think there's ever been a video game based on a soap opera. And the last game is the action-adventure Flashback from 1993. And this is the only game in the collection that is not the Amiga version. And that's despite the fact that this comes in a blue Evercade case, which indicates a computer collection. And it even says Amiga right on the front. But not only is this version of Flashback not the Amiga version, it's not even a computer version. This is the Genesis slash Mega Drive version of the game. Now, the reason why I think the Genesis slash Mega Drive version was included over the Amiga version is because that was the platform the game was initially developed for, even though it was actually released on the Amiga first and the Genesis Mega Drive version followed. Apparently, the Amiga version is a port of this version. Now, as usual, I played all these games on my Evercade VS. For the point-and-click adventure games Future Wars and Operation Stealth, I used the 8-bit though SN30 Pro. And for the action-adventure games Another World and Flashback, I used my Mayflash F500 arcade stick, just so you know how I played these games. And I did play all these games through to completion, although I did use strategy guides to help me with that process, some games more than others. So now I want to talk about each of these games in detail, starting with my least favorite, Future Wars from 1989 is Delphine Software's first point-and-click adventure. It was originally released on the Amiga with ports to the Atari ST, PC, PC-98, and the Sharp X68000. The funny thing about this game is that the full name is Future Wars Time Travelers, but that was the European release. When this game was released in France, it translated to Time Travelers The Menace. In North America, it was Future Wars Adventures in Time, and in Japan, it translated to Future Wars Time Adventure. So the story of this game is that you're a window washer in the present day who accidentally becomes a time traveler who then winds up fighting in a war across time against an alien race. And to be honest, that sounds like a pretty damn cool plot. Now, the gameplay is your typical point and click adventure game. Uh, the original game used a mouse to control the cursor on the screen. Here on the Evercade, you have to use a controller. One button will bring up a menu of actions, and the other button will execute those actions or indicate where on the screen you want your character to go. Now, I want to talk about these options in the menu you bring up, because some of them make sense and some of them don't. Examine, take, inventory, and speak. These are all straightforward and they make sense. However, where it gets confusing is with the use and operate options. Now, when you select use, it brings up a menu of items in your inventory, and that's because the use option is only for using items in your inventory on other things. And operate is only for operating things on screen that don't involve your inventory. So basically, if you want to open a door, you have to operate the door. The funniest example of this is when you need to shake a tree, so you have to operate the tree in order to shake it. So it's kind of weird, but you do kind of get used to it while you're playing the game. It's just kind of funny. Now, as I was playing through the game, I really only have two positive things to say about it. First, some of the cutscenes of the game have really good animation, and also some of the music is really good as well. 
However, I knew I was going to have problems with this game shortly after I started playing it because I didn't make it really that far at all before I had to pull up a strategy guide, only to find out I had to do things that really didn't make sense to me. So as I mentioned, you start out as a window washer, you make a mistake, your boss leans out the window and yells at you. It sounds like you kind of need this job and you don't want to be fired from it. So what actions do you need to take to proceed and start off this game? Well, you need to play a prank on your boss by filling up a bucket of water, putting it over a door, so when he opens the door, the bucket of water falls on his head. And I just would never have thought about doing that because if this was me, I wouldn't want to be fired. So right off the bat, I'm playing a character whose actions throughout the game don't make any sense to me. And then the other thing is that items are extremely easy to miss in this game. Not just because sometimes they're really small and you just don't see them, like in this bathroom where there's a tiny flag and you just don't see it. But not only that, but if you examine the bathroom, the game's not even going to tell you that flag is there. And that's due to the way the game is designed. When you examine something, it doesn't always tell you everything. It depends on where your character is standing in the room, whether or not it's going to tell you all the information you need to know or just some general information. And sometimes you could be like right next to the item you're looking at and it still won't tell you because you're just not in the right spot. But how are you supposed to know that unless you're looking at a strategy guide telling you that that item is there? And the game will have no issues letting you proceed throughout the game without important items you need later in the game. So you could get stuck trying to solve a puzzle that you don't realize you don't have all the pieces to. And another annoying thing is if you want to do something like open a door, your character won't open that door unless you're close enough to the door to open it. It's not like you say, I want to open this door and you click on the door and the guy will walk over to the door to open it. No, he'll just tell you, you need to be closer. And I just don't understand why he just won't do that automatically. And there are some times where you want to like operate something and you are standing right next to it and they tell you, you need to be closer. And the issue is not that you're not close enough. It's that the game wants you to be in a different location. And then the other thing is that playing this with a gamepad is much harder than if you just had a mouse. And if this was just a simple point and click adventure game, using the gamepad wouldn't really be that bad. However, there are plenty of sequences in this game that require you to move the cursor pretty fast. And one of these sequences happens really early in the game where you're stuck in a room where the ceiling is collapsing down on you and you need to enter a code into a keypad. But because the way the game is set up, you can't just punch in that number in the keypad. No, you have to bring up the menu, select operate, and then select the number on the keypad, and then go back to the menu, select operate, and then select the number on the keypad. And you have to do that five times in order to enter the code. And if you were controlling the game with a mouse, you could do this relatively quickly, but with a controller, it just becomes way more challenging than it should. Ultimately, this was an incredibly frustrating game, especially with the timed and action sections where you're meant to be playing with a mouse. Also, if I hadn't been playing with a strategy guide, there would just be so many items I would miss because the game didn't think I was in the right spot to even tell me that the item was there. I honestly don't know how anybody could have completed this game without any sort of hint book or strategy guide. I'm giving this a 2 out of 10. Next up is Operation Stealth from 1990, another point and click adventure game that originated on the Amiga, but then received ports to the Atari ST and DOS. Now, what I actually found most interesting about this game is that when it came to North America, it was published by Interplay and they had the James Bond license. So they just slapped James Bond into the game and called it James Bond the Stealth Affair. And they didn't really change much in the game other than a few people's names. So in the end, you wound up with James Bond working for the CIA, and that didn't really make much sense. But in this game story, you're John Glames, an agent for the CIA, assigned on a mission to find a missing stealth plane. And there are some twists and turns along the way, but that's the main focus of the story the whole way through. Now, the game is Delphine Software's second point-and-click adventure. And as such, it pretty much plays exactly like Future Wars. Same menu, same cursor, same everything. The only real difference is that you can now use items in your inventory with any of the menu options. So it opens up a little bit of more complexity with what you can do in the game. But as I was playing this one, I found it a little bit more enjoyable than Future Wars, just because there were several improvements that were made over that game. 
One of the big ones is that when you look at things, it'll now tell you everything you need to know about them instead of requiring you to be close enough in order to see certain things. Another big one is that you no longer have to be right next to an item in order to operate it. So if you want to open a door, your character will actually walk over to the door and open it instead of having you walk over manually and then opening it. And there's still plenty of action scenes in this game as well that would be easier to control with a mouse, but controlling that cursor with a controller isn't as difficult as it was in Future Wars. One of these action scenarios you play over and over and over again are these maze levels. There are a lot of maze levels in this game. A whole bunch of maze levels where you're avoiding guards and then a whole bunch of maze levels kind of in the dark where you're avoiding rats. There's just an overabundance of maze levels, but fortunately it's not too difficult to control the cursor with a controller to navigate in those moments. Though there are still action sequences that are difficult to control the cursor with, like this jet ski game, which took me multiple times to get past. And then there's still a whole bunch of timed elements in this game that are still kind of annoying to control that cursor with a controller, like where you have to escape a murder scene, otherwise you get caught and the game's over or where you've got to escape from this cage before it hits the water filled with piranhas. Or the hardest one of these scenes is where you have to swap out this officer's stamp and you only have like a fraction of a second to open up the menu and make the swap. And just like Future Wars, there's objects in this game that are very hard to find. Now for a really good example of this, I'm taking you to this hallway near the end of the game. The whole point of this hallway is just to walk down it. There's absolutely nothing in this hallway. So you walk through the hallway, you wind up in another room where you have a problem to solve. You have to deactivate the electrical field around the door before you could pass through. And then you wind up in this other hallway that looks very similar to the previous hallway you just walked through. So you just inclined to walk all the way through. But if you do that, you've lost the game because there's two very important items in this hallway that I don't think you'd find unless you knew they were there. So take a look at the screen. Can you find these important items? Well, let me tell you where they are. They're right here. It's a garbage can and an electrical outlet. Can't you tell? Probably not, because they're exactly the same color as the background. But these two items need to be interacted with, with certain items in your inventory, before you enter the next room. Otherwise, you're going to lose the game. And also, you do collect more items in this game than you did in the previous game. However, some of them aren't labeled very well. For example, you get this pack of cigarettes, and there's two types of cigarettes, and they do two totally different things. However, if you're just scrolling through your inventory, both types of cigarettes are both just labeled as cigarettes, and it's very easy to just use the wrong one. So yeah, obviously, I had to use a walkthrough to get through the whole game. Although I will say that the actions that you needed to take made a whole lot more sense in this game than it did in Future War. And while I did have more fun playing this one than Future Wars, simply because there were far fewer annoyances in the game, I still had issues and I don't think I could say that I liked this game. So I'm going to give this a 4 out of 10. Next up is Another World from 1991, and this is what I'd call an action-adventure game. Now, this was released on a ton of different platforms, and I did mention that I did play this back in the day, but the version I played was the DOS version, and again, because I'm in North America, I knew this as Out of This World. Now, you play as a character named Lester, who's a physics professor that's conducting a particle experiment when, without warning, lightning strikes and winds up transporting Lester to another world. Early on, you'll get captured and make friends with another alien prisoner, and the whole rest of the game is just trying to escape with your new friend. Now, I'll never forget the impression this game left back in the day when I first saw it, because I'd never seen anything like that animated so smoothly. And if you were to look at it today, you might think that this is like 3D polygons, but really the computers that were around at the time really couldn't handle these type of graphics animating this smoothly. So these are actually vector filled graphics and that's why it was actually able to animate so smoothly back in those days and why this game was ported so often and was able to run on platforms you wouldn't think that this type of thing would be possible. Now the graphics and the gameplay in this game were so well done that when the game transitions from the intro into the actual gameplay, the first time I played it, I didn't even know the game had started. And the game starts with you teleporting into like a pool of water. And unless you realize you're supposed to take control at that point, you're just gonna get grabbed from a monster below and die instantly. Now, fortunately you do have infinite lives and when you die, you just wind up at the beginning of that chapter again. 
So to progress through the game, you wind up doing trial and error, you know, trying one thing if it doesn't work, you know, when you get to that spot again, try something else until you eventually pass the obstacle blocking you. Now, the game kind of plays a little bit like a platformer. You could walk, you could run, you can jump. Now, the original Amiga version, you pressed up to jump. But here on the Evercade, they've remapped up to a button. So in order to jump, you can just push a button or you could push up. Either one works. And early on in the game, you'll find a gun. But before you find a gun, you could perform a kick. But once you do have that gun, you could tap the button to shoot. If you hold the button down a little bit more, you could create a temporary shield. And if you hold the button a long time, you could do a mega blast with that gun. And that has the ability to break through some walls, but it will drain your battery immensely. And I think you have like three shots and then your gun is completely empty. Though throughout the game, you can find areas where you can recharge your gun. Now, like I said, I did play the DOS version in the past, but as I was playing this Amiga version, it almost seemed to me like it was a little bit easier and I didn't know if it was just me. I didn't know if I was just now used to these type of games, but it turns out it wasn't my imagination. The game was originally released on the Amiga and then it was ported to the Atari ST. And then after that, many thought the game was a little bit too short. So every port of the game after the Amiga and Atari ST, the game was made a little bit more difficult and two additional levels were added. So yeah, one of the minor downsides to this game is that it's kind of short. In fact, if you know what you're doing, you could play through from start to finish in about 25 minutes. And I think most of the fun from this game comes from playing it the first time and using trial and error to see if you could find your way past each situation. But even when you do know how to make it through the game, there are still a couple tough spots in the game. And those mostly come from the gunfights you have with the alien guards as you're trying to escape. But still, I think that this game is still pretty fun to play and just kind of run through every once in a while. So I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. So the final game here and my favorite in this collection is Flashback from 1993. And again, this is another action adventure game. It's kind of like Another World, although it has more elements from point and click adventure games in it. Like, for example, you have a whole inventory of items that you'll need to use to progress throughout the game. And this game was released on a ton of platforms. It was even released on even more modern platforms like Steam, the PS4, and Xbox One, and Switch in 2018. And I had known about this game, but I'd actually never played it before. Now, just as a side note, in North America, this game has the subtitle, The Quest for Identity. And after playing the game, I can say it really doesn't make much sense because that's not really the focus of the story. In fact, your identity is revealed in the second level of the game. So the only thing I can think of is they couldn't just call it flashback for some reason or another. And they just decided to tack on the quest for identity after they played the game for about five minutes. So the game's story takes place in the future and you play as a guy named Conrad who has lost his memories and has just escaped from hostile aliens. You've crashed your hover bike in the jungle of an unknown planet and you start exploring to try and recover your memories and complete your mission, which you do find out very early in the game after you've recovered your memories. Now, when I first started playing this game, it felt a bit like I was playing Prince of Persia, only with a gun. All the actions are very well animated, but as a consequence of this, all the actions you take in the game don't always happen instantaneously. You have to wait for your animations to play out before you can take another action. Now, fortunately, the game will buffer actions for you most of the time, and it takes a little getting used to, but once you do, you can actually use it to your advantage. Now, there are a ton of actions you can do in this game. You could walk, you could run, you could jump up, you could jump forward, you could roll, you could do a running jump, you could do a running leap, and a running leap is different than a running jump. You could also do a running roll, or you could pull out and holster your gun. And while you're holding your gun, some of your actions behave a bit differently. Like normally when you're not holding your gun and you crouch, when you let go of holding down, your character will stand back up. But if you're holding your gun and you crouch, when you let go of pressing down, your character will stay crouched. And then you've got the extra element of your inventory. And the way this works is whatever you have highlighted is the item that you're holding. And you could use this to interact with objects and people in the environment. For example, if you want to unlock a door, you could hold on to the key and then interact with the key card reader and that'll open up the door. 
Another important item you have is your shields, and this can absorb four hits for you, except for certain obstacles which will kill you instantly, or if you fall from a great height, that'll also kill you instantly. But you can get hit and take shots, and the shield will absorb that damage for you for about four hits. But if you run across an energy generator, you could hold on to that shield and interact with the energy generator, and it'll be recharged for you. A couple other important items that you'll get is a force field, and once you get this force field, if you're holding it, you could use it to block gunshots. And the other really cool items you could get are the teleporter receiver and transmitter. And what you can do is you can leave the receiver in a certain area. And then when you use the controller, you could teleport back to where you left the receiver. And I just thought that was really cool. Now, like I mentioned, this was my very first time playing the game. And to be honest, I really got sucked into it. I love the whole running and jumping platforming elements, as well as figuring out my way through certain obstacles. And I thought the story was great as well, as well as the changes in environment throughout the game. And funnily enough, one of my favorite things about the game isn't even something that was intended. You see, there's a glitch in the Genesis slash Mega Drive version of the game that made it even more fun for me. See, it turns out you can walk through walls. And what you do is you walk up to a wall and then start to run away from the wall. But right as you do this, you turn around and let go of the run button. So he'll turn around and walk. And what he'll do is he'll just walk through the wall. And I loved experimenting with this throughout the game. And I usually found one of three results. One, you could find shortcuts. Second, you'll just fall to your death. And the third thing was that you could cause the game to crash hard. But as long as I did a save state before I tried walking through a wall, it wasn't really a big issue because I could just restore that save state. I also think I spent more time with this game than the other three games combined. As I was playing this, I was thinking of giving this a 10 out of 10 despite some of the glitches and flaws and some of the annoyances I had, you know, like being able to walk through walls or just having difficulty at times performing the right type of action needed for certain situations, like, you know, accidentally jumping straight up instead of jumping forward or accidentally holstering my gun because I didn't realize I'd already buffered that action. But I was just chalking that up to me messing up while playing the game. But once I hit the last level, there was quite a bit of slowdown in parts and it really threw my timing off with certain actions. So with all of those things combined, I really can't overlook it all. So I'm gonna give this a nine out of 10. So now all that's left to do is rank Delphine Software Collection 1 against all the other Evercade cards that I've already looked at. And with one game getting a 9 and another game getting an 8, that's going to put it on the B rank. And I'm going to place it just over the Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood Dual card. And the only reason I'm putting it above there is just because there's more games on this cartridge than there is on that one. So the next cartridge I'm going to be looking at is Full Void. Boy, this is an oddity because it's the only collection so far to only have one game in it, so I guess it's not really a collection, is it? Let's see here. Scared and alone, you must use all your skill to defeat the rogue AI. I've seen a uh, little bit of this game. It kind of looks like something very familiar that would be in the Delphine collection. That is to say, it looks a little bit like Flashback and Another World. I keep wanting to say Out of This World, but I should just be calling that... An, uh, 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 I should just be calling it Another World. Let's see, Full Void is a brand new 2D cinematic puzzle platformer. Well, that really does sound like another world in flashback. Uh, set in a dystopian future, well, that sounds like flashback. <laughs> You're trapped in an oppressive, hostile world controlled by an artificial intelligence. Fight your way through puzzles and obstacles to learn the story of this broken, run-down society where only children are still free. But for how long? Don't know. Two years? <laughs> 